you all for joining. If it's if you're joining for the fifth week in a row, apologies. You're going to hear my intro yet again, but for the newbies, um, here we go. So um, this is her stories. Um, this is a this is a program which is a collaboration between Newington Green Meeting House and Newington Green Alliance. So um, Amy and I, who co-organised this with, we came together in the wake of the debate generated by the statue for Mary Wollstonecraft on the green here. And it got us thinking about what feminism means and the stories of women that have shaped modern feminism in the UK today. Uh, we have a shared passion for women's stories, particularly focusing on minoritized groups and their many intersections. Um, so like <clears throat> class, race, gender, disability, and so on. And therefore, it was important for us to showcase as wide a range of voices as possible. So we want these sessions to be interactive, accessible to all, and promote discussion in a safe, open, and inclusive space. We are welcoming people from all backgrounds and focusing particularly on our Hackney and Islington communities. No prior knowledge is necessary, and we really want people to come away from these sessions feeling informed, inspired, and curious to learn more. If you joined us last week, uh, you'll have heard us discuss uh, the different types of feminists that emerged during second wave feminism. And this evening, we're bringing feminism to the present day as we discuss identity and body politics. Um, and next week, our focus shifts to campaigns that are taking place in the local area. And I think, yeah, I'm gonna pass so, over to Amy now. Thanks, Rashni. Um, I'm just gonna give a super quick introduction to the Meeting House. Um, so Newington Green Meeting House, the Revolutionary Ideas Project is the programme that I manage um, and is a National Lottery Heritage funded project that runs for the next couple of years. Um, and this is part of that, um, although we do this in collaboration with Newington Green Alliance that Roshni is going to say a few words about. Um, but I suppose the remit is um, we are the home of Mary Wollstonecraft, the mother of British feminism, and also the radical dissenters in that area that went uh, to, you know, that acted on and wrote things um, to try and make the world a fairer place. And so um, we do lots of outreach and programmes and events and all sorts of things to kind of share that history um, with the local area. Hi, and so I'm a volunteer with Newington Green Alliance and we're a community charity based in Newington Green. Um, and you can see here that the aim of Newington Green Alliance is to better the lives of everyone who works or lives in and around the uh, Newington Green by building a strong and sustaining community. And we do this through um, a series of different projects and community events that we put on. Um, we are entirely um, volunteer led. There's, I think we're about 90 strong now, and we really grew last year over the first lockdown um, and beyond. And here you can see just a few of the kind of projects that we cover. So it's, it's, it's the range of themes from kind of anti-racism work to refugee sponsorship, um, women's empowerment, which these events would come under, um, to youth groups, um, to mental health, and lots of other things that's just there to kind of help uh, build community and, and bring everyone together. And that's us. Uh, yeah, if you are tweeting along tonight, please do um, remember to hashtag us, um, her stories, and you can also follow us and we'll, putting the, we'll put the follow details in the chat shortly. Um, and now I would just like to hand over to our first speaker, uh, that's Lola Olufemi, and I'll let you do an introduction for yourself because you ought to do it much better than me. So thank you very much and welcome. Um, hey, uh, uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming uh, along. I'm Lola, I'm a Black feminist writer from London. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about basically um, how a feminist conception of gender can help us understand and tackle transphobia. So I'll be talking a bit about trans exclusionary feminism, but it also often occurs to me that people don't think or, or don't know what gender is as a structure. They know what it feels like, but not so much how it operates as a kind of system. And so this is supposed to um, hopefully 
uh, help people have some ideas about that. So um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about transphobia specifically in the context of feminism and how when we adopt a critical understanding of gender, we're able to understand the ways that trans exclusionary radical feminists, that's what TERF stands for very simply, it's a, a descriptive term, um, weaponize feminism in order to kind of justify their end. So I've shared these thoughts um, uh, in other places, but hopefully it should be useful for you. So feminism is a political project with lots of different histories, obviously meanings and concepts attached to it. Um, it doesn't belong to anyone. And to understand, I think, trans exclusionary radical feminism, a recently coined term, I think it's important to distinguish first between two overarching types of feminist approaches. So liberal feminism and then more critical forms of feminism, what people have called radical feminism, revolutionary feminism, etc. So trans exclusionary forms of feminism um, have their origins partly in forms of feminist practice that emerged in the 80s and 90s that saw male violence as a fundamental organizing principle for our societies and were specifically interested in um, the rootedness of male violence in the body, in socialization and genitalia. So some arms of this, feminist, um, this feminism had a genuinely radical um, and structural critique of our society um, and the way we live and some didn't. I think in a contemporary setting, some of the most um, well-known TERFs call themselves uh, radical feminists, harking back to uh, those legacies. But when we look at their demands and their goals and their beliefs, that um, I think they practice a kind of feminism that I would say is more closely aligned with liberal feminism. So liberal feminism at its simplest is a kind of feminist practice that doesn't want to fundamentally challenge or upset oppressive structures. It's interested in protecting and enshrining the rights of the individual as opposed, um, as opposed to kind of collective power. It thinks that um, things can be resolved or made better solely through reforming institutions, incremental change, law and policy, anything that doesn't involve the kind of wholesale restructuring um, of our society and the uh, abolition of prevailing structures of violence. So it wants more women in charge, more women bosses, more women presidents, um, and more critical or liberatory forms of feminism or revolutionary forms, forms of black feminism, Marx, uh, Marxist feminist, uh, feminism, socialist feminism, believe that this world is fundamentally unjust. They seek to kind of abolish hierarchies. They believe that in order to build a truly just and livable and pleasurable world, we need to dismantle and abolish and do away with oppressive structures like racial capital, um, capitalism amongst others. Um, and, that um, and the institutions that sustain them and that this is the only way we can transform our lives. So I think what liberal feminism does well in the contemporary age is reduce feminism simply to the act of like listening to women. So often people are afraid to critique feminists because they don't want to be accused of kind of like silencing women. And one of the tactics that TERFs use very well, I would say, um, to get support is to say that that the most feminist thing um, they or any, um, sorry, the most feminist thing an ally can do is simply listen to women. But we know in the world there are lots of different kinds of women or with different experiences of the world. So the idea that feminism equals listening to women lands us in trouble, obviously. Um, as a black person who's read as a woman in the world, my understanding of womanhood and my opinions about it, my feelings aren't gonna be the same as a white woman's by virtue of our um, different uh, positionalities, by virtue of our experiences in the world. So we already that already tells us that this thing that we call woman is not a universal category that means the same thing to everyone, everywhere, at any time. There are women whose ideas and opinions and actions place trans people in danger. So firstly, feminism has to mean something more than simply just listening to women or being a woman. We also have to recognize that it is a political project that seeks to make the world better for everyone, not just women. So broadly, I understand feminism as a political framework and method that we can use to make demands um, to the state and to oppressive systems of power for our freedom and for the freedom of others. Um, so once we subscribe to a more critical or revolutionary understanding of what feminism is and what it offers us, one that recognizes that our job is to make the world better for everyone, then we see how any feminist practice that seeks to exclude people from the scope of our protection or our consideration in that um, task is not a feminism that seeks true liberation. Ergo, not a feminism that's worth practicing. So two, what is gender? Often, um, I think people don't have a solid understanding of how gender operates and what it is, and this leaves them kind of susceptible to tough arguments and susceptible to being swayed in certain ways. 
Um, so there's, there's no way to provide a concrete definition of gender, um, one that would do justice to the kind of shifting, multiplicitous and very personal relationships we all have to it. We know that when we're born, doctors look at our genitals and they assign us a sex male or female, it is automatically assumed that our sex will correspond with our gender, man or woman. Turfs argue that there is a kind of meaningful distinction between the, the two sexes and that sex is a natural pre-existing immovable truth. So there is something essential to our biological makeup that make us male or female and thus men or women. And other turf arguments, if not focused on biology, will argue that there's something immutable and unchangeable about how we're socialized as men and women that is fixed and cannot change. So the, the fixedness of our gender slash sex, so that's what I'm going to call it from now on, can feel very real because the language that we use to talk about it is rooted in scientific fact. And we're taught to think of science as objective, factual and, and true. But um, we know that scientific fact is a result of paradigm shifts, experimentations, uh, experimentation, scientists often think one thing is true and then another person comes along and proves them wrong. So the sex distinction, this idea of male and female, is something that we constructed to make sense of each other. It's a system we assign to bodies so that we, we can recognize each other and, and we map a whole bunch of cultural, political, social and sexual connotations onto those assignments. So countless historians, anthropologists, gender theorists have written about how the meanings of gender slash sex have changed over time and how they they look different depending on geographical location, on how sex slash gender, um, and sorry, and how the sex slash gender distinction um, became solidified at the, at the height of colonial rule as part of a kind of ideological program of imperialism. So we don't often talk about the connections between um, imperialist endeavor and gender. So feminists who seek liberation have understood sex and gender as a political system of signs, norms, restrictions that enables oppression. So that system of signs tells us what we can and cannot um, can and cannot do. It tells us how to dress, how to talk, what we should like, how to express emotions. It's a kind of tyranny. So sex slash gender is the way we communicate who we are to others and ourselves. When we talk, uh, when we walk, when we speak, when we dress, we're creating a story about ourselves that aims to communicate to the world who we are. And before that system of signs, before we invented male and female, that sex distinction to help us understand one another, there were just bodies. Um, and not only is, is there not a meaningful distinction between sex and gender, I think, because sex is gender as far as our society is concerned. We expect that female means woman and male means man. When we transgress that system of signs, when we do gender incorrectly, when we don't live up to what is um, expected of the category we've been assigned to, we're punished, some of us more harshly than others. For trans people, that punishment can mean death. Um, think also of the butch women who are seen often as failed women because they're not feminine or non-binary people who are spoken of um, like a kind of inconvenient complication or trans men who are accused of being traitors by TERFs. Um, when we understand sex and gender as not something innate or natural or pre-given or God-given, but a system of signs with political consequences, we know that women are oppressed in our society um, and that they are put in danger by that system of assignment. Then we see that the goal of feminism is not to to reaffirm or reform that system of signs that we call gender by giving women a little more power or trying to gatekeep who is a woman and who is not. It is to end the violence that we experience as a result of the imposition of the sex slash gender, um, sorry, as a result of the imposition of sex slash gender in our lives. So ending that system of signs or abolishing slash challenging the sex slash gender binary also means committing ourselves to ending all other oppressive systems that constitute it, no matter who who we are. It, it makes no sense really to talk about gender without talking about race and class because they all constitute each other. My own personal experiences of being a woman are shaped by um, heavily by being working class and by race and racism, um, almost done. So in the meantime, on the way to abolishing this system of signs and this process of um, assignment um, that makes our lives difficult for many reasons, this system of signs that means that trans people have to opt to undergo invasive, costly, draining medical procedures that are controlled and restricted, uh, restricted by the state 
so that they can lessen their proximity to violence, mockery, humiliation, so that they can be read in a certain way or experience peace of mind and agency. In the meantime, what do we do? We have to make sure that feminism as a political project invested in building a just world for all does not become the banner under which we reaffirm the sex, um, uh, sex dissension and the gender binary or the idea that there is something essential that makes us a man or a woman. Lots of people talk about their own gender in personal terms. So gender um, slash sex feels real because our lives are shaped by these systems. But we, we also have to understand gender as a political system of categorization. Um, if we understand it that way, then we understand how saying that uh, gender slash sex are constructed is not the same thing as saying that they're not real or that they don't have tangible consequences. Um, yeah, so we have to, uh, I think, to understand that women is not defined by nature and to pay attention to the ways that structural oppression puts all of us women, trans and cis, in danger. The task is to get rid of the danger. That's the thing that unites us under this category that we call woman. Getting rid of danger means committing ourselves to workers' rights, protecting and extending the welfare state, making sure everyone has unmitigated access to medical care, for example. Um, those uh, are all kind of trans rights issues. We have to commit ourselves as feminists to ending gendered violence for everyone. We have to realize that the violence we experience as women is not solely defined by our or others' uh, genitalia or socialization. Um, it has to do with capitalist exploitation, borders, prisons, the family, policing, racism, our position as workers and so on. We also have to begin to see that in um, uh, that any attempt to define woman will inevitably exclude all of those women who do not do womanhood correctly. So because womanhood is shaped by things like whiteness and heterosexuality, that means black women, lesbian women, and so on. The point is not to strive for a kind of singular universal understanding of woman, it's to go in search of freedom from the system of signs that limits our potential as human beings. So in the public arena, when we're bargaining for more rights or trying to stop the domestic violence shelter from closing or being part of a union dispute or crit um, critiquing austerity, we have to understand that law and policy and institutions only really understand the language of woman and man. And so we use these um, political slogans or the language of women's rights, for example, not because we think there is a singular definable thing called woman um, that, we've, uh, that we're attached to, but because we need more rights. And so we're responding to the urgency of the moment. So refusing categorization means embracing chaos, playfulness, um, queerness, letting go of rigidity. The point um, um, in the here and now, I think, is to do away with the idea that individual people are to blame for the way that they conform or don't conform to the visual script that gender dictates. Um, the task of ending gender depression is entirely, I think, inseparable from the task of protecting trans people and extending trans life. So our enemy in that, the, the, our only enemy in that regard then is that system of science that seeks to reduce us, not one another. Thank you, sorry. I whiz through that, but I hope that was useful. That, that was brilliant. Thank you, Lola. I feel like I'm going to have to watch the recording again to take it all in. <laughs> that, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to pass us on to our next speaker now. It's uh, Rory Patterson Ackenbeck. Um, welcome and thank you. Thank you so much for that. And thank you, Lola, for that um, amazing speech. Uh, yeah, I'm really grateful to be here. Uh, my name's Rory, I'm a uh, researcher and artist and um, I've sort of written some thoughts down already so I'm just going to read those out for you and yeah hopefully you can all hear me okay. When approaching any discussion around transness or trans life there is often an assumption that it must necessarily revolve around suffering. Rather than joy, flourishing and community, transness is weighed down and imprinted by dispossession, violence and death both physical death and the forms of social death when bodies are denied their humanity. One fear often experienced by trans people is that the discussion will be framed as a form of liberal debate where good points are made on both sides, but the subject remains. To what extent is this group of people considered viable? To what extent can they even be considered human? This is not a new method or tactic. Anyone who knows even a fraction of history about our colonial past, about historical liberation struggles, knows the extent to which the tactics of dehumanization and the denial of humanity became necessary for the continued exploitation and consumption of largely racialized bodies. What I hope to do today is urge us to keep asking questions of ourselves and, as I assume most people who are here today would call themselves feminists, ask questions of our feminism. Where do we look when the categories of human provided to us are limited, stifling and result in dead ends? 
If the world has chosen the natural end point for trans existence to be trans death, how can we defy this categorization and look beyond the ways in which bodies are contained to ways that can be liberated? This is most certainly a talk grounded in a profound commitment to hope and imagining otherwise. But in addition, I also want to ask us another pressing question. What do we do when the people questioning our existence and our humanity are the very people who have historically provided some of the only real safety and comfort to us? I'm inspired to ask this question as a result of a situation I found myself in about a year ago when I was producing an art piece called The Lesbian Family Sound Archive. Anyone that knows me, even a little bit knows that I come from a lesbian family, that I have two mums. I always make a point of letting people know as soon as it becomes relevant, relishing in the inevitable mess of responses this news sometimes provokes. Admiration, confusion, jealousy, and sometimes anger. The aim of the art piece was to reconnect with the people, localities, and idiosyncrasies of my queer childhood, reaching out to the networks of kinship I'd lost touch with after growing up and leaving home. I re-entered spaces of joy and love where we embraced, shared food, caught up, etc. The experience was overwhelmingly lovely. However, there was one experience I had while making the piece which I haven't shared publicly. I won't discuss any names or specifics. It's not my project to persecute or function within any carceral logics when talking about such experiences. If I didn't still have love for these people or believe that we are all capable of learning and changing, I think my arguments against essential notions of the human as fixed and permanent would become invalid. That being said, I come from a position of immense privilege within the broader trans community, and it is similarly not my project or place to dictate how others respond when they feel unsafe, as I did in this moment. The usual talking points were covered. Voices were raised. It's not trans women I'm against, it's men taking advantage of women. Toilets, Hampstead Heath, trans men don't really exist, they're confused lesbians. At one point I was shown an email from the LGB Alliance, a group who makes some decent points. This is possibly the scariest part. These resources full of hate were being shared through networks initially established between queer women as spaces of safety away from patriarchy and homophobia. I tried my hardest to be generous and accommodating with my responses, but in all honesty, I was terrified. I was not out to everyone at that point. I was still unsure of myself and yet inadvertently arguing for my own existence. There's an extent to which these conversations simply act out long held oppositions between the individual versus collective strains of feminist and queer activism. I know these conversations well and this felt different. Now it's important to note that without a doubt, the main sources of violence against trans people come from the police, the medical system, and the men who are so ashamed by perceived emasculation that after sleeping with a trans person, they kill them. This violence is overwhelmingly experienced by black, indigenous, and other trans people of color. And within the broader queer community, I would say that the most antagonism comes from gay men and white affluent gay people in general. Why then are we so obsessed with TERFs and why are they so obsessed with us? And not just your standard right-wing conservative TERFs masquerading as feminists. How has neoliberal propaganda been so successful in turning some of our closest allies and loved ones against us? And how can we begin to love each other again? And beginning to think through these questions, I felt compelled to continue looking back at my own childhood and upbringing, where these communities were first formed and where I slowly figured out what queerness felt like. I want to use this framework of looking back to trace an alternative radical conception of queerness that exists beyond any word I can use to name myself or align myself with. Harnessing this queerness, I believe, is essential if we want to forge solidarity across division. My first name was Imogen. When my parents went for a scan, they thought I was a girl, something to do with the orientation of my body. After the initial shock when I was born, they realized they had the potential to raise a boy in an all-female feminist household. After a few days of deliberation, they settled on Rory with one of the Irish spellings, which quite literally means red-haired or red king. Some of the gifts and embroidered artifacts from my birth still have the initial I on them. And in amongst the R's and other initials, these lingering eyes function as a reminder of the spontaneity and coincidence of multiple selves. This affect of transitory fluidity is one which continued to color my childhood. Indeed, colors worked against the grain. Clothes were handed down and exchanged. There are pictures of me in dungarees and tutus, pushing buggies of dolls around, pretending to read and write before I knew what letters were. Gender felt insignificant, unmoored. Family too had a broader meaning. 
We had our little unit, of course, but houses and parks were sites of constant movement and flux. Our borders were porous. Other lesbian parents and children were always around making noise. Love was given equally, regardless of which family or heritage you belong to. These were non-hierarchical spaces where we ate and sang together, where queer adults created the memories denied to their friends they had lost. After all, this was the turn of the century. The 90s were coming to an end and that virus was moving away from its position as a mass harbinger of death into the realm of stigma and shame. Section 28 would not be revoked for another few years. All I can really remember from this time was the incredible matter of factness of it all. Nothing felt radical or transgressive because there was nothing to compare it to, no benchmark against which I was measured. When people would ask me what it was like to have two mums, I had no answer for them. How could it feel otherwise? It was very loud, it was, there was lots of music. I always felt very loved and wanted. Things started to go wrong when I left the abstract world of childhood into the world of predestined categories where I started having to fill forms out asking for my father's name and occupation. The movement into adulthood was a movement towards legibility. I realized, yes, my body was being judged against specific standards and regimes I had no control over. They were what gave my body value. Strength was not my mum being able to carry five Sainsbury's bags in one hand, but rather being able to run away quickly enough or escape from underneath a pile of heavy adolescent bodies. From observation, the problem wasn't so much being gay as it was being feminine, being less of a man. I could only be straight as being gay would be to prove them right, that queer parenting is always a doomed project which transforms children into monsters just like their parents. I've always hated the childhood defense, the argument that we are corrupting children, depriving them of their childhood, that we are instilling ideas about gender and sexuality too early before they are ready. This way of thinking requires an idea of the child that is constituted as a mindless, stupid, and not fully alive or capable being, but it also acknowledges them as an incredibly powerful force for revolutionary social change. They can't make decisions about their own bodies because if we started letting them do that, they'd start questioning everything else. Children are the most intelligent people on the planet. We just never listen to them. As a child, I would not have been able to use lengthy academic jargon to pontificate about my existence, but I would have been able to articulate discomfort, confusion, fear, what made me happy and what made me sad, what felt wrong and what helped. The act of gendering is a largely painful experience. I say this knowingly as a controversial statement, but not without precedent. Rather than reading endless streams of Judith Butler, although that certainly came into it, it was the reading of black feminists and feminist writers of color that allowed me to understand how sex and gender actually work and why it was so painful. It was writers such as Hortense Spillers, Chandra Mohanty, Sarah Ahmed, Audre Lorde and Angela Davis who taught me that gender and sex are not timeless categories but historically specific constructions. That inventions of race and sex by European colonial regimes functioned as a means to segregate, subjugate, control, compartmentalize and commodify bodies. They told me of the horrific experiments done on the bodies of black and indigenous women as well as intersex people, mainly children, in attempts to fix them policing any transgression outside of normative categories. Significantly, they taught me that the category of woman, womanhood as we understand it, is not only constructed and defined by patriarchy, but also white supremacy. When bodies deviate from the naturalized idea of femininity, when they are too hairy, too tall, too curvy or not curvy enough, the wrong shape, the wrong type of genitalia, the wrong sounding voice, they're deviating from whiteness, which is in turn a definition a, sorry, a deviation from womanhood. When TERFs shudder at the horror of hairy bodies invading women's bathrooms, I hear racism, the fear of the racialized other. It makes you wonder, will they ever invent any new insults? The hatred of trans people, particularly trans women, relies on a well-trodden lexicon entrenched by the logics of homophobia, anti-blackness, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, objection, shame, notions of invasion, a conspiratorial threat of the enemy hidden in plain sight. The ways trans people are spoken about, spoken about with such a racialized language as a means to demonize them exposes the fragile logics of both race and sex and how dependent they are on each other. In a sense, diagnosing this particular state of turfdom we find in the United Kingdom, or what Sophie Lewis has referred to as the rainy fascist island, is no difficult feat. British people have no knowledge of history, of our colonial history and the ways it still produces the lives we lead. 
In the Turf's insistence on the irreverence of biological sex, I see a refusal to accept one's complicity in this ongoing system of colonial power, a refusal to accept that maybe there are other re reasons why people have awful lives. It is of no accident that most, if not all, TERFs are white and affluent. I would argue that rather than viewing the trans-inclusive and trans-exclusionary division as one drawn along generational lines, it is one drawn along the lines of race and of class between legibility and illegibility. These once radical queer women who I grew up with have found themselves now somewhat accepted, somewhat financially secure, able to marry, to have bought homes when it was still possible. They have become legitimate in the eyes of the state. Their lives became just commercially viable enough to be included within the purview of capitalism, flourishing as the poster women of homo nationalism. In contrast, trans people, especially trans people of color, fall between the cracks. A queer precariat, if you will, an undeserving poor who are denied access to work and denied access to already limited public resources. Turf ideology undeniably follows on from the harshly individualistic political outlooks of Thatcherism, New Labour and the austerity governments of the 2010s. As I was growing up, our communities became more and more divided. Those who were allowed to succeed, survive even, began to see the suffering of others as a personal failure. Turfdom, if anything, is a movement against solidarity. It denies the possibility of coalitions across lines of distinction. I see nothing redeemable in such a belief system, just as I see nothing redeemable in the systems of power which inculcated it. Against so much hatred, it becomes almost impossible to have any sense of empathy towards these people or to believe that underneath there is something redeemable. However, if there is a possibility, I wonder if we might use these conversations to try and rekindle that sense of solidarity. And when I say we, I'm specifically referring to us white people, those who can rely on our swathes of privilege, who will most likely not be considered disposable, who can be fairly certain that if the police are called, we will come up the other side. Where can this empathy come from? I find it in the statement that the act of gendering is a largely painful experience. What I see in a lot of people who think themselves to be TERFs is an immense amount of pain and anger and a scramble to direct that anger somewhere. TERFs always talk about how awful it is to be a woman, how excluded and subjugated you are. In many ways, it seems like TERFs hate being women and hate what it has done to their lives. But then they take this logic in the wrong direction. TERF ideology capitalizes on an all too pervasive vitriolic attitude, which I recently learned has a name, crab mentality. The idea that if I can't have it, then neither can you. If I have learned what it means to be gendered through pain, then so must you. If I have had to live a restricted life, if I've been taught to hate my body, then so must you. Now trans people know all too well the pain of gender, of being gendered, of feeling anger at the ways people perceive your body through this framework. But where we depart is where we direct our anger. We look beyond the pain to the frameworks and categories which caused it. In fact, one of the most revolutionary things I believe trans people have been able to do is rediscover a euphoric conception of gender, which is this enabled precisely through denying the power it has over our bodies. Trans people have found an insistence on joy, of aliveness, of love and community in a world outside the fixed of categories. Turfs could learn so much from us if only they would listen. Um, I know I've run out of time, I've just got one last little bit to say. Um, it's a fascinating question to ask. What is queerness? Any strict definition always falls flat. Fittingly, queer is a word which has historically resisted static definition. In its reclamation, queer has come to embody this politics of negation and resisting legibility. This is an embodiment I recognize in my childhood, an accidental or rather incidental radicalism which refused the expectations of gendered bodies in my blissful ignorance. I don't mean to paint my childhood as without any difficulty or confusion or single out my family as special. We were made through our community, our collectivity. When I try to think of a possible way forward for creating sociality beyond the gender binary, my mind turns to these communities of mutual aid and affection, where I'm sure we're just as filled with conflicts, arguments and fallings out. They're a starting point, a lump of plasticine to be molded, shaped and reused into forms of welding that are truly revolutionary. So where does transness come into this? If queerness is against, transness is across. We act against the world as it is and imagine potentialities across division and beyond what is currently considered possible. That is the beauty and the hope of trans. 
it is a knowledge that our salvation is not within the categories that have historically defined and excluded us. Queer and trans lives reveal that we are made by and through each other. Indeed, trans is a prefix. It is ca characterized by its need to attach to other words, enhancing and expanding their definition. It literally means across. Like queerness, it denotes movement, multiplicity across time and space, fluidity and flux. We hold on to this dynamism, for as Joy James remind us, the word revolutionary denotes dynamic movement rather than fixed stasis. If we embraced transness, what would that mean for our social movements? If we placed a trans affect at their core, if we committed to a collective solidarity across categories created to divide us, a transnational solidarity across and for the abolition of borders and nation states, of the gender binary, of racial categories, of the hierarchies that we place on bodies, what world could we look towards? Trans existence is by its nature an imaginative utopian state of being. It is an insistence on enacting the future in the present. More than anything, I identify trans life as a form of direct action, which the late David Graeber defined as a stubborn insistence on acting as if one is already free. I take these words and hold them with me as I move across, against and beyond towards glimpses and promises of otherwise and elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rory. Um, that was wonderful. And thank you for sharing that with us also. Um, we are going to go into breakout rooms now um, where you will be able to um, discuss this, um, the topics that Lola and Rory spoke about in a bit more detail. Um, the facilitators, can you give us a wave, facilitators? Uh, facilitators there with NGA <laughs> in, uh, in the name, they're gonna be leading the sessions and they've got the questions that are gonna be based on these kind of um, topics. Um, I'm going to say thank you very much to Lola and Rory. Um, again, you're welcome to join us for the breakout rooms and you're also welcome um, to leave. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I'm going to open the breakout rooms now. See you later. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Lola. Great. I think most people are back. Um, Roshni, do you want to host the bit um, where we go through the groups and see what they've been chatting about? Yeah, of course. Uh, let's start with um, Daisy's group, please. Yeah, sure. I'll just feed back quickly. We kind of we spoke about so much. So our question was, um, can we or how do we celebrate the achievements and work of earlier feminists whilst also recognising trans rights? So we kind of spoke a bit about um, rather than kind of using the word celebrate, we can still kind of build on what's been done by by previous feminists but also we have to do that by questioning what they've what they've said and not treating kind of their word as gospel and see feminism as kind of more of a journey um rather than kind of a static thing that we can just sort of take as one thing that's happened in the past and something that we're just going to carry on with um and we kind of just touched upon how um the more sort of second wave feminist was predominantly ableist racist colonial and supported a specific type of women um so we need to kind of interrogate that feminism and um yeah make sure that we're constantly kind of on this journey of making it more open and inclusive um reimagining it um and then also how we touched upon how as feminists we have a responsibility to learn more and interrogate how feminism went wrong in the past um, so yeah, we kind of moved away from that sort of idea of celebrating the achievements of earlier feminists. Um, but then we also said how we can be grateful to them by sort of, I think it was Sophie used the really nice sort of metaphor, as we're on a horizon, we're going to keep moving forward and we're going to keep learning. So it's not kind of saying you're, this was wrong, but it's actually that idea of building on those ideas and kind of moving towards a better place. Brilliant, thank you so much. That sounds like such a great discussion you had. Um, Eliani, would you like to feed back from your group? Yep, I'm having some tech difficulties. So I can't turn my camera back on, so I'm just gonna be a voice. Um, but our question was, why might anti-trans narratives be perceived as generational and how, I, how might we overcome this? And we essentially came to the conclusion that it's not so much generational, but kind of about who you know, who you're, who you're like associated with, 
we had a nice range of different people from different generations in our group so had lots of different perspectives um so and kind of heard about how we all knew different things and different amounts and had different engagement with this type of discourse um but also kind of recognizing um that there's a lot more access to this information and these discourses and conversations which is something older generations wouldn't have had so there's a gener generational aspect um, in terms of that so you can kind of see it growing up um, whereas I definitely didn't really see it growing up but more kind of more recently um, and it can also and also recognizing it can be hard to um, kind of engage in for older generations because there's not really kind of a protocol and how to go about it and it can be hard to know the right thing to do. So we kind of spoke about how some people um, who are trans like that to be part of ide their identity and some people might not want that to be a big part of ident their identity and it's hard to know kind of how to navigate that. So we kind of just came to the conclusion it's about kind of getting to know people and respecting their wishes and asking questions um, and also kind of getting used to these conversations and our own opinions. Um, yeah, that's a brief summary, but there was a lot of good conversation going on. Sounds like it. Thank you. Um, Louise. Actually, I, I was in um, Lauren's group. That's my fault. I messed up the breakout rooms. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's why I didn't say it, but I will um I will hand over is Lauren still there? Okay, thanks, Lauren. Yeah, I can take over. Um so our question was um why is this conversation taking place now when conversations about exclusion of trans women has been going on since the 70s? Um and uh we yeah we we talked about a lot of different things um the main the main kind of focus was really that in the 70s um everyone the conversation was so much focused on kind of sexuality at that point that i don't think there there was even enough airtime to to start going into um the the sort of the other groupings of of you know people who are being excluded it was a it was kind of a one step at a time thing Unfortunately, we're now at a stage where trans people feel like they can speak up and say that this is their reality, these are the struggles that they're dealing with. And fortunately, that's come along at a time when actually it's quite trendy now to be woke. And there's um, we're talking about even the kind of like zeitgeist of TV shows like RuPaul's Drag Race, where, you know, conversations about transness have come up even within that show um, and it's just become much more of the kind of general conversation um, that's involving people that otherwise wouldn't necessarily um, be part of that um, and also as we've spoken about in previous weeks um, the benefits of social just in general as a platform for people to be able to have their voice heard and kind of give the reality of their situation and fortunately get you know a huge amount of support from allies and other people who've experienced the same thing um, but then the flip side of that is as with anything on social you also get people on the other side of it and we were talking about you know JK, JK Rowling and her opinions and it actually being very damaging um, and the, the conversation is obviously still kind of rife at the moment with everybody weighing in with their own opinion. Um, and we're just we're just in that stage now where there's a lot of people that just need to be educated um, mm -hmm. and stop reacting out of kind of fear and anger about stuff that they don't understand and they're lash lashing out against. Um, and whereas what actually needs to happen is they need to join things like this where they can actually have you know their their eyes opened a bit to the reality of, of of other people and not make assumptions based on their own you know their own sense of something that they clearly don't understand um so we think that while it's while it's great that you know the conversation is happening now we've still got a long way to go but as with as with everything else i think i think with baby steps we will get there 
So that's basically what we're talking about. Thank you. Yeah, I think that education piece is so important. So it's really glad, I'm glad that we're out here having these conversations this evening, it can only help. Um, I think then I was the final group. Um, so we were discussing some of the ways that um, BIPOC, trans and non-binary people are discriminated against because of their identity at the intersection of being trans, non-binary and people of colour. So we actually started out talking just briefly about another question which Rona had posed previously um, in the session and it was about um, fat being a feminist issue uh, and we agreed that you know the way that fat women are treated is kind of gendered in itself and we talked about how or how we do treat fat people in general that they are marginalized in the way that kind of disabled people are marginalized um, in their sort of exclusion from spaces for example like planes not accommodating larger bodies and stuff because of um, just trying to um, fit more people into the spaces uh, and how it's, it's also kind of a class issue in terms of like access to healthcare, etc. And um, the fact that um, fat people obviously sometimes um, are not treated fairly within healthcare systems, for example, their pain isn't always believed and it can take a lot longer to get to the root of an issue because it's just um, their kind of their, their body is used as an excuse. Um, and then uh, Rory kindly just spoke a little bit more about their background and upbringing. Um, and then we got to the question and thinking about how um, trans people of color are the most marginalized um, it's because, well, for a start, um, Black people are amongst the most marginalized groups anyway, and trans people are people too. So they kind of, one of the reasons why they are kind of in the most marginalized groups. Uh, and uh, Rory talked about the misogyny at play in the demonization of trans people, because the kind of the benchmark that is set is the patriarchal male ideal or the patriarchal notion of the female ideal and anything that deviates from that is what is what is um, um, discriminated against. Uh, and then we talked about all the nuances of diversity and kind of like looking at everything from an intersectional point of view, there's so much more at play. Um, please remind me if I've left anything out. And then we also touched back on to um, class and a little bit on JK Rowling, who <laughs> we already touched upon, obviously. Uh, and that's us. I think mine was the last group, and I know we're running over time, so I'm just going to um, quickly sum up what we spoke about, which actually was a bit naughty and we didn't really speak about our question. Um, but we spoke instead about um, accessibility and this conversation um, because it was really interesting. Um, a few of, well, I think we all agreed on the call, but um, we were talking about how this these topics are um, really important, but sometimes the language can be quite hard to understand. And obviously today we've got two speakers, amazing speakers, but are both from academic backgrounds. Um, and if you've got a certain level of education or experience, um, for example, someone on the call was saying, I don't have that um, academic background, but because it's a, in a topic that's um, I'm very passionate about, I've done my homework basically, you know. So thinking about how do we, how do we better have these conversations um, in accessible ways that means that a wider um, kind of community can engage with them. And that's not to say that what Rory and Lola spoke about wasn't accessible, but that um, I just gave the example of like my brother, for example, who's a very kind of like working class, works with his hands, you know, kind of man. And I think he would completely agree with everything that we have spoken about. Um, but would probably one not come to an event like this which I think is part of the problem and uh you know and two um you know maybe wouldn't have understood understood some of the concepts and I think that's part and parcel because we're covering an awful lot of ground here um you know and so 
there's um and I think that Lola and Rory did this beautifully but um Lola particularly kind of went and spoke about the kind of basic concepts of um of gender and what that is for example and I think that um that was um very helpful um yes yeah, so I think that's what we were talking about accessibility and how do we make um this more accessible which is a bit like what Benjamin said about also part of that work is widening it out and not just having it within feminist frameworks because some people aren't going to be involved in feminist frameworks. Yeah, and thank you all for your contributions again. Um, I love, the, I say this every week, but I love the conversations that we have um, after the speakers and the fact that the speakers we do have inspire such kind of deep discussions. It's brilliant. Yes, and our, our facilitators, we couldn't do it without you every week. Thank you so much. And just to say that next week is the uh, final Her Stories for now, although it's been quite a success. So Roshni and I are going to be planning what happens after this. But um, next week we have got representatives from local campaigns from Islington and Hackney um, talking about some of the issues that are affecting um people in the communities today so we've got a representative from sister space um, speaking we've got a representative from the women's equality party we have um wendy forrest who um leads hackney history group and she's just put together a compilation of 100 women from hackney's history um so we can hear a little bit about that about the act of kind of recording and writing women into history um and then we have um, representatives from the Reclaim Holloway campaign too. So please do join us for that because I think that's a really lovely way to finish her stories as in here's some learning and then here's some things that you can do. Thank you for everyone for filling out. Well, which is really nice. Sorry, Amy. Definitely. No, great. Yeah. Um, okay. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us and hopefully we'll Thank see you next you. week. Thank you. Bye-bye.